Assalamu alaikum. So having already looked at material failure for ductile and brittle materials in our course so far, we will now turn our attentions to a structural failure mechanism known as buckling. We will be looking at the buckling of columns. Now co columns are basically long and slender beams which have compressive loads acting on them. Now if the compressive load exceeds a certain critical value, then the column may undergo large lateral deflections shown like so. This is basically known as buckling. Now buckling is an unstable failure mechanism which causes sudden collapse and because it is causing failure, we must account for it during design just as we account for yielding and for fracture. Okay, so in order to first start our analysis for buckling, let's consider a simple model of the column. Let's consider a two-bar mechanism with a spring attached at the pin A right here. Now the applied compressive load is aligned with the axis of the, of the two bars and when they are in ver the vertical position, then the system is in equilibrium. Let's disturb this equilibrium by a small amount delta by displacing this pin at A towards the spring like shown. Now this causes forces to be set up in the spring and in the two beams. Now the restoring force set up in the spring tries to bring the two beams, push the two beams back to their equilibrium position and the value for that force of course is just given by the spring constant times the amount that the spring is displaced by, so k theta. Whereas there are also forces set up in the two beams. The horizontal component of these two these forces tries to disturb the two beams, disturb the system further and move the pin at A to the right. Now this disturbing force is actually the horizontal component of the force acting in the beams given by 2px. If we find it in terms of the applied load then we get 2p tangent theta. For equilibrium, our disturbing force must be equal to our restoring force. That is, the, the force in the beams must be equal to the force and setup in the spring. So we get a critical value for the load when the system remains in equilibrium at the displaced position. Now if we solve through, we essentially get a value for this critical load. Now what's important is not this exact value because this depends on the system. The point is actually that if we have our applied axial load P, which is less than P critical, then our restoring force will win and basically bin, bring the two bars back to their equilibrium position. Whereas if our applied force P is larger than P critical, then the disturbing force is larger such that the system uh, uh, stays in a, a disturbed position basically. Uh, and the displacement delta carries on increasing. Considering our column again shown like so, so we have a beam which has a compressive load P being applied here and then we bring some small disturbance to it. We can think about the different situations that we've just discussed. So if our applied load P is less than P critical and then we bring a small disturbance to disturb the initial equilibrium of the system, then our restoring force is larger, as I said, such that the, after the disturbance is removed, the system returns back to its original position. Now this is known as stable equilibrium. Whereas if we have an applied load P, which is larger than P critical, and then we introduce our disturbance as before, this time around the disturbing force is larger, such that our system carries on, uh, carries on being displaced so that it would look something like this. Now in, in this instance our mechanism is in unstable equilibrium. Finally there is also a situation when our applied load may be equal to the critical load of the system. Now in this case even when we remove our disturbance our system remains in that displaced position. Now this situation is known as neutral equilibrium. Okay, so clearly this critical load PCR for a system is of utmost importance. And what does it, what does it uh, represent? The critical load basically is then representing the load at which the system is on the verge of buckling. 
or it is on the verge of unstable equilibrium if our load becomes higher than the if our applied load becomes higher than the critical load then the system would undergo buckling failure so this is of utmost important as design engineers that we need to ensure that for our columns or for our structures the applied loading remains under or below the critical load for that system okay so just on that note let me show you an example of uh, buckling basically so please note that this 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 can is representing my very unslender column with the compressive axial load being applied by the weight of these two these two discs um, and now let's see if uh, what happens if i bring in a small disturbance from this equilibrium position to see whether whether our load is greater than p critical or less than p critical for this system so if it was less than p critical then it would basically remain in this in this equilibrium position whereas it, if it was larger than p critical then some unstable uh, displacements would occur so let's take a look so my small disturbance is being represented by this q tip and clearly right here our applied load was larger than p critical such that the disturbance leads to buckling of the system now one important thing to note here is that this this disturbance is not the not the important thing the disturbance may arise uh, naturally in a system because of let's say imperfections in the material and so on and so forth or for physical systems even just because of the wind blowing on a on a building so what's of importance to us is that Uh, is that the loading that we are applying to a system that remains less than the critical load okay so please please be careful that we do not avoid buckling failure by ensuring that there is no disturbance because there will always be some or the other disturbance in real world physical systems we ensure that buckling failure does not occur by making sure that our system is not being loaded beyond the critical load okay we can discuss this in more detail in the q&a so clearly then our critical load is of utmost importance for any given system and we must be able to find it for our uh, for our systems of interest so what we will do is we will start with a particular type of column which is the pin pin column and see how we can find pcr for it okay so first of all uh, there are a few assumptions for this analysis so um, firstly we are assuming that our material is homogeneous and linear elastic and that our column is uh, perfectly straight uh, before lo before we load it up that is it's an ideal column with no imperfections in it third we assume that the load that we are applying is through the centroid of the cross section so it's basically being applied axially through through our column um and finally we assume that the the buckling or the large lateral deflections they only occur in a single plane okay so with those assumptions let's first consider our let's consider our first example of a column now this is a pin pin column now what that means is that it has two uh, ends which are supported by pin joints now please recall that pin joints ensure that there are zero displacements but allow free rotations okay so we are looking at this type of pin jo uh, this type of column with these two boundary conditions okay now if we have an axial load p being applied to the column we know from just the discussion that we've had that as we start to increase the load p such that we reach the critical load pcr then we reach the verge of buckling or the reach the verge of becoming unstable if we if we increase the load beyond pcr then we will cause buckling right however if we decrease the load beyond p critical less than p critical then the column will basically return back to its original position uh, even when the deformation even when the sorry the the small disturbance is removed okay so clearly the ability of a column whether it returns back 
or it carries on laterally deflecting or bending depends on the resistance of the column to bending. So if we want to determine what PCR is, we actually need to consider the bending of this column and see how resistant it is to bending. Okay, now uh, for bending analysis, you may recall from Mechanics of Materials 1 uh, um, analysis that the deformation set up in a beam due to any applied bending moment on it are given by a particular relationship. Now this is actually the moment curvature relationship um, which is important because it basically tells, up, uh, tells us that if we apply or if we have internal bending moment m set up in a beam then how much will the beam bend by or what will be the deflections in the beam given by v right here. So essentially if we use the moment curvature relationship then we can perform an analysis of how resistant a beam is to bending or not. Okay, so, so hopefully this will become clear slowly. In case you do not recall what the moment curvature relationship is or where it came about, this is, please take a look at section 12.1 and 12.2 in Hibbler and then we can discuss it in more detail in the Q&A section. Okay, so this uh, expression right here, the moment curvature relationship ha has a few terms in it. Let's, let's take a look at what each of these are. So here, as I've already mentioned, um, V is our deflection of the beam, which is being caused by the moment that is set up in the beam. Okay, so this is the internal bending moment in a beam M, which causes a deflection V of the beam. Now, um, X is of course the position along the beam, E is the Young's modulus, I is the moment of inertia of the cross section of the beam and together EI is referred to as the bending stiffness or the flexural rigidity. Okay, now there are a few sign conventions for what a V can be or what M is essentially, so let's, let's consider these. So for M, we essentially consider a, a positive sign convention as shown right here, that is we consider um, anti-clockwise moments to be positive on the right hand side of the beam and on left hand side cuts we assume clockwise moments to be positive such that we positive bending moments basically cause a, a beam which is uh, curving upwards okay so it looks it has a uh, it has a shape like so as shown here and for the deflection V um, we will consider V to be defined positive upwards from the initial uh, equilibrium position of the beam. Okay, now also on this diagram, the as I we've already said, the positive sign convention of the beam is also shown. So if you look at this, you can see that this is a concave upwards or a curving upward beam, hence why there are positive bending moments here, whereas in this part of the beam, it is... Um, curving downwards, so uh, therefore the bending moments in this part of the beam are negative. Okay, so we, we will just keep these keep this sign convention in mind for the moment curvature relationship as we begin our analysis. Now, okay, so if we look at our moment curvature equation, basically why it's important is because if we determine what the bending moment in a beam is, if what M is, then we can solve this equation we can solve this uh, differential equation to find what V would be. That is, we can find the deflected shape of the beam. And that's quite important for us, as we'll see shortly. Okay. Notice that if we want to solve this differential equation, it is a second order differential equation. So we also need some uh, boundary conditions for it. Now this, these boundary conditions are given to us by what the problem setup is for the beam. So for example, if a beam is uh, has a pin joint at a given point, then we know that the deflection at that point must be zero, so V is zero. If we have a roller, similarly, we know that the deflection is zero and there are no conditions on the, on the rotation uh, for a pin or a roller joint. Whereas, if we have a fixed end, if we have a fixed boundary condition, then for that we know that both the displacement 
and the rotation at the fixed end of the beam are then constrained to be zero. So that is for different types of supports, we have different boundary conditions acting on a beam and using these boundary conditions, we can solve our moment curvature relationship to get the shape of the, uh, to get the deflected shape of the beam. Basically, that is to find the deflection V of a beam at any given point along it, X. If we do that, then for any given problem, we can actually draw out what the deflected shape of the beam is. Now, this is important for our buckling analysis because that is also actually a problem in beam bending with particular given uh, boundary conditions. So let's go back to our ideal column with our pin supports. Okay, so in this case, as we had discussed, we have two pin joints and a, an applied axial load P right here. Okay. So to determine the critical load of the of the pin pin column, we will actually use the moment curvature relationship for it and see what the deflected shape of this beam uh, turns out to be basically under a given load P like so. So let's see this analysis. Okay. So. That's what we're saying. We have a pin joint column shown right here, pin at B and pin at A and an applied axial load P right here. Okay. So if let's first assume that it has buckled. So if it has buckled, it takes a shape like so. That is, it starts to take a bent shape. Okay. Let's find out that when it does have this bent deflected shape, what is the bending moment that is set up in the beam so that perhaps we can find Okay, what is the deflection of the beam or what is the what is the equation defining the shape of the beam okay so to find the internal bending moment of the beam of course we need to go back to our method of sections so for our method of sections what I'm first going to do is actually just draw out only the beam with its global uh, the 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 forces acting on it globally so we have of course the applied force p right here and now considering global equilibrium that means that i must also have an applied force p right here so it doesn't it's not necessarily p dash it is actually equal to p just looking at equilibrium of this problem and now let me find out what the moment is let's say at a point x from the top of the beam Okay, so in order to find the moment at point X from the top of the beam, I need to make a cut right here. So I make a cut right here so that I get this section. And then because I'm talking about a beam and I've made a cut, then I need to introduce an internal force and an internal bending moment. Now looking at force equilibrium, I can see that my internal force is just equal to P. So P prime or P bar is equal to whereas for m I need to find out what it is basically and how I can do that is let's say by taking moments about q right here okay um, now one thing to note is that as before I've defined uh, x as the distance or the position along the beam such that it's being defined from point a from the top of the beam and my deflection v of the beam is given positive to the right Okay, so with these definitions, I then know that this point, this, this point Q is at a distance of V from its initial position. Okay, so now just perform moment equilibrium about Q so that we can find what M is. So it turns out that M is basically equals to minus PV, right? Just straightforward moment equilibrium. So then we already have our moment curvature relationship. What now we need to do is substitute the moment expression, what the moment we found into the moment curvature relationship and then solve this partial differential equation, okay? So, uh, <laughs> so basically we're just setting up this equation in a form so that we can, we can use some standard uh, differential equation solutions to solve it. So we will not be going into too much detail about this. Uh, I'm sure you've encountered solving differential equations in your maths courses. So please, please do take a look at this. This is an equation with constant coefficients. So we use one of the standard functions for it to solve it and see that the uh, equation for this particular type 
uh, of differential equation is given by this expression right here okay so let me repeat I'm not doing anything fancy going from here to the solution I've just identified that I already know that this is a type of second order differential equation which I know how to solve okay so this is a second order differential equation which is homogeneous that is it has a right hand side which is zero um, it is second order because there is a power of up till two and it is linear because it only contains linear terms with constant coefficients so this is an equation which which takes the general solution of this form okay so I've substituted in my respective variables considering the general solution okay so once we've got this general solution for our deflected beam then we can go back and look at the boundary conditions for our particular problem we know for our particular problem that there are pin joints at A and B that of course means that the deflection V must be zero at x is equals to zero that is at A and also at x is equals to L that's at B so all that we do is substitute x is equals to zero under this expression first and at that x is, at that x we have v is zero and solve for it so we see that because of x is equals to zero this disappears that is then we end up getting just this expression right here must be equal to zero now this is equal to zero uh, uh, c2 when c2 is zero okay so just solving through it by applying the boundary conditions next we have our second boundary conditions at x is equals to l again that the deflection is zero there too so solving that i get that this expression so c1 sine of square root p divided by e i l must be equal to zero let's have a think about what the solution to this equation is basically so one solution is that our c1 call c1 c1 is 0 and then this will be fulfilled however that basically means that our deflected beam is completely straight that is that is not a that is not a bending solution that's the that's the solution when uh, there is no buckling occurring so that's a trivial solution which we're not interested in so the other possibility is that our sine term so sine of this uh, variable in here must be equal to zero now this is true only if the argument for the sign actually takes um, multiples of pi right because considering a sine function function we know that it is equal to zero at multiples of pi so at zero at one pi at two pi and so on right so of course it can't be equal to zero because these things are all physically physically uh, uh, existing variables so there is a length there is an applied load there is a beam so the only possibility is that if n takes values going from one to and whole numbers onwards okay so if i rearrange this expression now to get our load our applied load p because that's what the whole game was so I can get then an expression for the applied load P for which we get a deformed shape of the beam which fulfills the given boundary conditions that if you have an applied load P then it can take this shape so only for these values does it take this deflected shape and can fulfill the boundary conditions now of course the smallest value of p is the one for which buckling already occurs and the smallest value occurs when n is equals to 1 so that is the critical load for our pin pin column basically so when the critical so when the load reaches this pcr which when we substitute n is equals to 1 we get this expression right here pi squared ei divided by l squared then the beam will undergo uh, will become will come on the verge of buckling basically okay so this is basically an extremely important result 
Now this uh, formula right here for the p-critical is known as the Euler formula for a pin-pin column and uh, it's important because it's telling us uh, that what would be the uh, critical load for a pin-pin column uh, given its uh, uh, the properties of that column essentially. So this critical load uh, as design engineers we have to ensure that we do not exceed the critical load. So we always maintain loading on that column which is less than the critical load. Okay. Okay, so what are the other properties? So let's see what p-critical actually depends on in terms of the column properties. So of course it depends on the material on E. It depends on the young modulus of the material. It depends on I, that is the, mm, the moment of inertia of the cross-section. So it depends also on geometric properties of the cross-section. And it's also inversely proportional to L squared. That is, the longer the length of the column, the lower PCR would be. Have a think about this, basically. So um, it's also the length of the column that influences what the critical load for buckling would be. Okay, so, yes, because uh, as I've said, this is known as the Euler formula. This load P critical is also known as the Euler load, um, named after the person who first performed this analysis for buckling. Okay, yes. So what does the, uh, the shape, the deformed shape correspond to? We already had written down that C2 was zero. So we only end up getting V is equals to this expression right here with N is equals to one being substituted in here, right? So we already know what P is. So we put all those values in and we can see that from a, for, a, for a beam with length L, this actually corresponds to half of a sine wave Thus, the deflected shape looks like this. And C1 then corresponds to the largest deflection that occurs at the midpoint of the beam Vmax. Now, we do not need to concern ourselves too much with C1 because this is an unstable failure mechanism. So this Vmax actually, uh, it keeps changing. The beam is buckling. So it's not actually in a fixed position it's not neutral equilibrium it is it will once a pcr is exceeded it will go into unstable equilibrium such that this v max can keep changing basically okay okay finally there are higher modes of buckling which are also possible depending on what the value of n takes right however practically speaking buckling would have already occurred when n is equals to 1. Um, therefore, it's only this uh, mode of buckling that we're interested in because failure would have already occurred. And that's, that's the, we are, we're just interested in failure. We're not quite interested in what pretty shapes we can get the beam to make. Okay? Okay. So, um, uh, it bears, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning this formula again. So, the Euler formula looks like this. PCR is equals to pi squared EI divided by L squared. I would recommend that you uh, commit it to memory because it is just that important. However, for your uh, assessments, you will be provided the, the formula. Okay. So, there are a few other things that we need to consider in this. Please note that our Euler load, PCR, does not have any dependence on the yield strength of the material. There is no sigma y popping in here. That means even if you, if you change your material so that you get a stronger material, right? So for example, uh, instead of a high strength steel, uh, instead of low strength steel, you end up using high strength steel that would no, make no difference to p-critical. That would make no difference to buckling failure because both of these types of steels actually have uh, a similar Young's modulus E. Okay, So by using a stronger material does not uh, give us any advantages in terms of buckling. Okay. Secondly, instead of the strength of the material, it does depend on the uh, column's geometric dimensions or geometric properties. That is, it depends on the cross-sectional moment of inertia and also on its length. Okay, so these are some of the design parameters that we can then manipulate 
in order to uh, make our beams less susceptible to buckling. So how can we increase it? By either increasing the flexural rigidity or the bending stiffness or by reducing the length. That is by making it less long or less slender essentially. Okay. Finally, um, there are a few other things that are worth mentioning. So of course, uh, as we discussed for unsymmetrical beam bending, the moment of inertia of, our, of a cross section is actually different depending on which axis you choose to measure it. So for example, if I take a rectangular cross section like so, it has a, uh, if I look at it very carefully, I can spot which has a larger moment of inertia. So I can see that IB is it has areas distributed further away so ib will be greater than ia in this case right so if our p critical actually is directly proportional to the moment of inertia so which axes would buckling then occur about right have a think about this so it would occur about that axis which has a low pcr because that could be exceeded very easily so a low PCR we would get when I is less. That is, for this given beam, it is more likely to buckle about the AA axis rather than the BB axis. Okay, Because it will buckle because of the least moment of inertia, the weakest axis that we have. The weakest axis that we have. Okay. So uh, generally as design engineers, we want um, all of our axes to have similar moments of inertia so that we don't have one particular weak axis. Okay? Um, and another approach that we could have is that if our axes um, do have different moments of inertia, then we can uh, provide some extra supports about that axis. We'll, we'll discuss that in the second part of this lecture basically. Okay. Um, so uh, axes, so geometric shapes which have similar moments of inertia about different axes um, are of course circular tubes or square tubes which have uh, the moment of inertia about the x-axis uh, and about the y-axis which are approximately equal. So that's why we tend to use these for columns essentially. Okay, so lastly there are also uh, some ways to view our Euler formula in slightly different ways so of course um, our moment of inertia actually is a geometric property so we can actually represent it in terms of the cross-sectional area so if we use the cross-sectional area of the beam then we can define this radius of gyration r which represents the average distance from the axis that the points are distributed at, that the areas are distributed about, okay? So for any given, if any given beam. And if we do that, then we're writing our moment of inertia I in terms of its cross-sectional area and this average distance that the areas are distributed away from the axis, R squared, the radius of gyration. Substitute that into the critical load such that we now have A right here. Now what if I take this A to the left hand side of the equation, then I of course I get a load divided by the area which is the longitudinal stress set up in the beam so that I can represent my critical load in terms of the critical stress. Okay, So this time around I can represent it in terms of the critical stress also taking my radius of gyration R into the denominator so that I only get material property on the top on the numerator and this geometric property L divided by the uh, a cross-sectional radius of gyration in the in the denominator. Now this L over R, the length divided by cross-sectional dimensions, is actually a measure of the slenderness slenderness of the of the beam. Okay, so have a think about this. So we are saying that if we have, let's say, a circular beam, then we are defining slenderness. That how long is it if we have L divided by its R, which is a cross-sectional property. 
so it tells us how slender it is if l is very large compared to the cross sectional dimensions then this slenderness ratio will be will be will be large whereas if it is a, a short um, a short uh, uh, short beam essentially then it has a low slenderness okay and it's sort of stocky and a fat beam and it will be better to resist buckling basically so um yes so we can classify our columns using this slenderness ratio and we can plot our sigma critical against our uh, slenderness ratio uh, as something like so now the reason why this is important let me point out what's happening here so we have our critical stress plotted on the y axis and our slenderness ratio on the x axis being plotted for two different materials one is aluminum and the other is steel okay so of course as our slenderness ratio increases that is i get to long beams so as i'm going there i'm getting long beams i know that if i have long slender beams they will buckle at a lower stress right that is why the critical stress is decreasing with the slenderness ratio they will buckle at a lower load they will buckle at a lower stress okay so they are more susceptible to buckling whereas if i have short fat stubby beams with low slenderness ratios then they will have very high critical ratios uh, uh, sorry very high critical stresses okay so it's a good comparison it allows us basically that we could compare our critical stress against the yield stress of the material so i could draw out horizontal lines right here so for example if i am looking at aluminum the lower curve right here it has a yield stress of 27 ksi so i can plot where 27 ksi is like so similarly for steel i can see that the yield stress is 36 so i can also plot 36 right here now the usefulness of this is that beyond this let's say beyond this slenderness ratio l over r the critical stress is higher than the yield stress what does that mean that means that as you are loading up the material you will reach sigma y first that is the material will fail because of yielding rather than you ever reaching the critical stress that is for this regime right here you will only get failure because of yielding no buckling however for these slenderness ratios to the right hand side as you are increasing the stress in the beam you will hit your critical stress first and the beam will buckle and fail because of buckling and you will never reach yielding okay so uh, it's this sort of analysis that we can perform using the critical stress against the slenderness ratio graphs and these essentially allow us to define what is the slenderness ratio for a beam for a given material which we need to be careful about that underneath it or longer more slender beams than that will cause buckling um so we must ensure that we actually Uh, let's say for steel that we want to stay in this regime right we don't want buckling to happen um and for aluminum we want to stay in this regime right here we'll discuss this again if there are more questions regarding this later on okay so let's look at an example an example of a pin pin connected column uh, and analyze its buckling so we have an a36 steel here with some particular cross sectional properties which is to be used as a pin pin connected column and we want to determine the largest axial compressive load that it can support before it either undergoes buckling or yielding now note here that we've already discussed that this buckling is a structural failure whereas the steel yielding would then be a material failure it's not necessary that uh, buckling leads to material failure okay so for this problem then we are given a list of geometric properties the area of the cross section uh, ix and iy all of these these three are 
properties of the cross section whereas its length of the column is given right here on the diagram and then finally we have also its material properties that is its yield strength and its Young's modulus so let me just write all of this down up here again condensed and then start to analyze this problem so you may want to increase the playback speed because it takes me a while to type this up so we know that our Euler load is basically PCR is equals to, we've just done the analysis, for a pin pin column, it's pi squared EI divided by L squared, right? Now in this expression, we've, we, we've discussed that I, the one, the, the moment of inertia about which buckling occurs, is the one which is the weak axis, that is the axis with the lower moment of inertia. So let's go take a look at the uh, moments of inertia that we're given. And we can see here that, of course, IY 15.3 is less than 45.5. So in this case, it's IY. Y is the weaker axis which dominates buckling. Okay, so this is the one that we have to use to find the critical load about this axis. Okay, so I'm going to call this PCR Y because it is the critical load for the Y axis. Similarly, uh, correspondingly, there is also a PCR X, but that PCR X is larger than PCR Y. Uh, hence, why if failure was to occur by buckling, it would be because of critical load about the Y axis. Okay, so if I substitute, plug in all the values, that is pi squared E and i y and for l squared I, I i have three squared then i get a value of 3.36 newtons i think sorry 3.36 mega newtons just by substituting in all the values okay now this this doesn't quite uh, tell me much right now so okay okay agar if i want to avoid buckling I need to keep my applied load less than this okay but what if okay, if I keep it less than this it can cause yielding so what I then need to do is also actually consider yielding failure so let me consider okay, if I if I if I am analyzing material failure what load would it fail at okay so for that I recall that my sigma y yield strength is of course just the load applied let's call it py divided by the cross-sectional area of the beam right so what is py i can substitute in for sigma y multiplied by a and if i do that i get 2.03 mega newtons Now we need to look back very carefully and have a think. So what, uh, what, which one, will it be buckling failure or will it be yielding failure which will occur? Okay, so let's have a think. So basically we are saying, if we start, let's, let's assume that we have no load acting on this, um, on this column. And then we start to apply load on it. That is, we start to have a P acting on it. Okay, ठीक है जी तो P जो है वो हमने ramp up करना शुरू किया है अब मैं ऐसे for more clarity I'm plotting it कि हम time के साथ P को बढ़ा रहे हैं ठीक है जी P आहिस्ता आहिस्ता increase कर रहे हैं अब क्या होगा when I reach ठीक है जी P yielding है 2.03 तो clearly जब मैं if I reach P Y जो है that is somewhere here and P critical जो है that is buckling load, wo kahin usse larger hai. P critical idhar hai kahin. Theek hai ji. So clearly, I will reach the yielding load first. Right? And as soon as I hit this load, my material will start to yield. The steel will start to yield. Whereas, ab isse zada to increase kar hi nahi sakti load. Already yielding ho chuki hogi such that P critical will just not be reached. So that my point is that in this case, it's actually the yielding, 
it's the yielding load which is critic which is uh, which dominates failure and it's it's this load uh, which is the maximum load that our structure can bear basically okay um in the worked example in the in the in the in the textbook and in the slides the solution it's done in a slightly different way uh do take a look at that too um because there there is basically another way of uh, finding the maximum load that a, a beam can bear um and we can uh, have a discussion on that okay so th that's it for this week's lecture i just want to briefly mention ke next week what we will be doing next week basically we will actually look at some other types of columns so for now we've only looked at a pin pin column next week we'll consider what if we have uh, columns with some other boundary conditions okay so different types of supports um okay thank you